So good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Bryars, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm joined on stage with, uh, by my colleague, uh, Emily Nielsen, who's program coordinator and has been leading the task to really understand the research landscape at the Turing to ensure that we can derive value from the great research that has been undertaken and to achieve scientific impact and real world impact. Uh, yes, so as Christine mentioned, we've got a growing list of universities at the Turing, and with them they bring a growing number of researchers with various research interests and scientific expertise. We've also got a growing list of partners, and each of those partners have got their own sets of problems within data science and artificial intelligence. So our role as an institute is really to facilitate collaborations between those people and those partners and make sure we're really maximising impact in our challenge areas. Uh, you can read more about our challenge areas on the website. So Mark and I, about six months ago, started a task to really understand the research landscape at the Turing. And we started by trying to think about the different questions our various stakeholders would have. So for example, our funders might want to know what projects we've got that are making impact in healthcare, or our industry partners might want to know if there's researchers working on specific problems such as missing data and how they can apply that to their institutes. Um, and our researchers really want to know who is working on what, who they can talk to, who they can collaborate with, and which areas of scientific expertise. Um, me personally, in the business team, I certainly get asked almost daily who can present at this conference on AI or who can present at a social science conference. So we started to make a framework to really map and understand the research, and Mark's going to talk you through some of the more technical aspects of that framework. So... We didn't prepare these slides with the yellow background. I think that's just the way it's been displayed. Um, and so I apologize for the, um, for the lack of ability to actually be able to see this slide because the slide is very busy and also the fact that there's this yellow background. Um, and um, I should also reference the fact that the alluvial diagram that I'm going to talk through um, was generated using the rawgraphs.io website, which is quite a cool website. Uh, generates quite funky diagrams for free. Um, at least I, I assume it's for free, maybe, maybe we should have paid them, but, but anyway, we didn't, and um, I'll, I'll give them some free advertising now. So um, what I want to do is just talk through this diagram. You don't really need to understand the detail, I'll kind of pick out some um, use cases as I go through. So you've heard twice now that we're very um, challenge-focused at the Turing, and those challenges are linked to our strategic partners and what they're trying to, trying to achieve, and if we can solve those challenges, i.e., um, revolutionize health through uh, personalized medicine or manage security in an insecure world through better intelligence production, then we can really meet our charitable objectives, which is to make positive impact to UK society and UK PLC. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, um, if you squint hard enough, um, you'll be able to see that there are eight challenges. And what we needed to do um, in developing this framework was really to understand how we can link our university partners and the massive amount of expertise in the university partners, which is represented on the right-hand side of this diagram, with the challenges that appear on the left-hand side and how we can kind of make sure that we bring together the right research in the right combinations of ways in order to, as I said at the beginning, maximize impact both scientifically and with respect to the real world. So starting at the left, we've got the challenges. Um, what we then did, um, so the second column, represents 16 of the fundamental data science challenges that we believe exist within the data science uh, research landscape. So we'll be publishing a document very soon on this, um, which exposes these 16 challenges in more detail, but I'll just pick on a couple of them. So, for instance, automating data wrangling. So for those of you that are actually data scientists in the audience, or uh, I suppose, given that I'm at COGX, I should say artificial intelligence experts in the audience, um, you'll often be presented with a data set that you've never seen before, and so you need to go from actually a data that you've never seen before to understanding some of the high level statistical properties of the data prior to actually doing anything sexy with the data like deep learning or any of the funky stuff that you see outside. So this data wrangling process actually takes allegedly about 80% of our time um, in order to um, kind of get derive value from data. So just to, to elaborate that further for those of you that don't know much about data science, um, you get a data file. The first thing you need to do is to find out how to actually read the data file. So that takes quite a bit of time. You're Googling around, especially if it's a binary file and you don't really understand the format. So can we automate that process of actually understanding and reading that file? Once you've, then, once you've opened the file, let's assume it's a tabular file. Um, you've got a bunch of columns in that file or it's a SQL database of some kind. You then need to establish whether um, you know, the, the columns represent categorical, real-valued, ordinal variables and so on. 
And so um, that process of variable um, identification also needs to be semi-automated or fully automated if we can make it, such that, again, we're saving um, data scientist time in this process. As you move through that process, I won't bore you with the whole process, as you move through that process, you get to the very end of the process, arguably, at least I would argue, you get to the end of the process, which is to try to perform um, exploratory data analysis. Um, and you may have come across a tool that was developed out of Cambridge University known as the Automated Statistician. Um, and so that forms part of this, um, if you were looking for a solution space, that would form part of this um, solution space where you throw it a data file, which is fairly well structured. You've moved the outliers, or at least you've characterized the outliers in different ways. You've um, populated missing data, etc. So you pass it to the automated statistician, and it automatically generates you a report summarizing the key statistical properties. So that, in itself, the automated data wrangling problem, um, we believe is one of the 16 core challenges in data science. A second one um, I'll pick at random. So um, heterogeneity, um, as any good data scientist will tell you, um, you need to use different sources of data. You need to do a variety of data sources in order to extract value and produce the intelligence that you may need. So in my area, I lead the defense and security program at Turing. And what we often have to do when I'm working with GCHQ is not just focus on one data source, but pull in many different data sources. So if we think about the variety of data that exists in social media, we've got video data, we've got text data from uh, tweets, for instance. And in the context of defense and security, we may have um, police, for instance, passing as written reports as well. So we need, in that case, um, we need um, text process, we need video process, we need some audio process, and we need the ability to fuse heterogeneous data sources that may be subject to uncertainty, may be subject to um, noise, may be subject to, um, in the defense and security world, may be subject to people trying to trick us into thinking something else is going on. Uh, so data sources that we don't necessarily trust. We need to combine those in a statistically coherent manner in order to, again, derive value. So you can see that what we've done is really, hopefully, um, you can see, if you can, anybody can actually see this list, um, you can see that we've given it some thought in terms of the types of challenge that need to be solved um, in order to make progress in data science and artificial intelligence. So none of these particular problems, none of these scientific problems, will be solved by one researcher doing a research project for three years. This is a set, this requires a multidisciplinary collaboration of many experts across different academic fields working for many years. This isn't a plea for funding for those of you that are in any um, research um, councils in the audience. Uh, I'm just saying that you, we're going to require many different types of individual working on these problems. And solutions to these problems, combination solutions to these problems will help us to achieve uh, our goal um, through our partners. So I've spoken about the expertise. Many of you will come across labels such as artificial intelligence and um, we at Turing have a definition of what AI is, which is probably different to everybody else's definition in this audience and, and out there. Um, we, we all understand um, mathematical modeling because that has a more precise definition, um, and likewise optimization, etc. And these, so these are terms, um, so in the third column from the right, these are terms that we normally see um, utilized in academic circles to characterize departments and other such um, kind of groups of individuals with um, particular knowledge. If you go and talk to any one academic, um, typically, um, if, if you speak to them for long enough, they won't, have, they won't claim to have expertise in the whole of artificial intelligence, depending on who you're talking to. They will have expertise in one or more of the subject areas on the right-hand side. So I realize you can't see any of those. So for instance, they may, be, they may have real deep expertise in um, statistical asymptotics, or it may be in the area, I can't even see the slide myself, estimation theory, or linguistics, or logic, and so on and so forth. So it's combinations of the individual specialisms that we get from our academic experts, and at the Turing Institute, we're lucky enough to have, uh, well, anywhere, depending on the day and the numbers that we use, anywhere between um, 100 or so academics to um, 500 academics. We've got 500 or so people, all with different specialisms, we can combine those in different ways and group those into kind of people who broadly understand AI, broadly understand machine learning, et cetera. And it's the combination of those expertise um, that allow us to really um, solve these um, scientific, core scientific problems that I mentioned, which link us to the value in terms of making impact in the real world. So this research mapping framework, uh, there's a report that we've just produced, which has been circulated to, uh, well, many people now. 
Um, Emily and I have been tasked by um, Shana and her colleagues in the communications department to actually take this 50-page report and condense it down into something that is digestible. So um, doing something that we don't often do, which is blog. Um, so we're going to be producing a blog about this uh, very shortly in terms of how one can go from scientific expertise all the way through to making real-world impact um, in, in order to kind of achieve our charitable objectives, as I said earlier. So the list on the right-hand side, all these scientific specialisms, um, I think Christine alluded to the fact that we utilize data science in order to achieve that list. So one of the things we could have done to try to establish what we think the data science landscape looks like at the Turing is to go and send everybody a questionnaire and ask them to fill it in. The academics in our research community, they're all friendly, but they're not that friendly that they will be willing to respond to our questionnaires. And so what we did was to um, crawl the internet, download um, all of the fellows and, and researchers' publications for the past five years and use, um, everybody knows, well, most people will probably come across latent traditional allocation, also known as topic modeling, and that allowed us to produce this list on the right-hand side. So that's how we got the list on the right-hand side, and we kind of went through a process to, to develop the rest based on the list that we generated utilizing data science. We then, once we'd done the topic modeling to produce that list, uh, we then needed to classify each academic with respect to the individual specialisms. And then for that, we just used a very simple um, naive classifier to actually establish that a particular academic has a particular specialism. And when we do project work, so projects will sit under, arguably sit under this area here, or when we run one of our amazing events, or when we run um, anything at the Turing, um, we tag it now with, everything, with the list on the right-hand side, and that's allowed us to build up a um, graph database, or, or rather a, a database which we're now utilizing, a graph database to represent uh, the data that we have. So I'm gonna give, hopefully give you a very quick demonstration if, um, if this works. So you were, again, you won't be able to see this. Um, so what we've done here is, so uh, we're utilizing Neo4j, um, for those of you that know graph databases, and what I've done here is um, there's a cipher query at the top, and I've asked it to search for my own area of expertise, so Monte Carlo Bayesian inference. So as Emily said, one of the questions we often get asked, or one of the questions I often ask Emily is, um, who should I be working with at the Turing? Who's got relevant expertise? Who can complement my expertise? Um, who can I work with, et cetera? So this graph database for this particular simple query allows me to find individuals that have both expertise in Monte Carlo, and there's a number of individuals in that space, expertise on the right-hand side in Bayesian inference, and the group of individuals in the middle will be the group um, of individuals that both have Monte Carlo and Bayesian expertise. And so this graph database is quite cool. We've now got, or we're now loading in more and more data, so we're loading our projects, activities, et cetera. Uh, we can obviously traverse the graph. We can run graph analytics. We can find out who's the central person at Turing running some um, you know, centrality measures over the graph. Um, who's the core person? Who, 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 if we, uh, who should we give massive pay rises to, essentially? Um, and I hope I'm right at the center of that graph, and, and, and perhaps Emily as well. <laughs> and, um, and, and really understand what's going on at Turing and really kind of drive our investment decisions based around data science. So we, we've got the framework. We've now got a load of data associated with the framework. So just to reiterate, we can go from individual expertise all the way up to our challenges and demonstrate the value that we're delivering to our partners and the real world value that we can deliver uh, via our um, charitable objectives. We've got a graph database with a, an ever increasing amount of data that we're pumping into it. Um, as you may have kind of noticed from that demonstration, it was utilizing Neo4j's out of the box um, front end. Um, I'm, a, I'm a statistician and not a very good programmer and I spent some time with Emily programming that interface. It's likely to fall over at some point um, and it's not likely to scale very well to the number of users that we want to expose this tool to. And so what we're looking for um, is for somebody that is much better at software engineering than me uh, to come in and take over this tool and actually to professionalize it. So this is a cheap way of advertising to the audience why I've got an opportunity um, to say to you, if you want to come and work with myself and Emily, on this particular project, um, the kind of expertise we're looking for is well, essentially kind of professional software development expertise. If you've got some NoSQL based expertise or experience, that'd be great. But that's not essential because we can, um, if you've got, uh, sorry, yeah, you can generally pick up NoSQL relatively easily. Um, and we want you to start as soon as possible. So I know it's a tall ask, 
and we're probably going to pay you next to no salary. So it's a really tall ask, if I'm totally honest. Um, but it's a cool place to come and work. Uh, so if you do want to come and work with us, then um, please come to our website and apply, and we'd love to have you working with us. Um, and that's not the only way you can engage with us at the Turing. So there's lots of other ways, some of which are here, and Christine touched upon the data study groups. So I would encourage you to go on our website and find out more. We also have a series of master classes, and all of these are mostly live streamed. Um, if not, they're on YouTube, so you can check those out. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be around for most of the day, and or you can email us at research at Turing. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.